Geocentrism How Can the Sun Go Round the Small Earth? by Malcolm Bowden When two bodies circle one another, they actually circle around a point somewhere on the line joining their centres. This is known as the barycenter, and its position along that line depends upon their relative weights. If, say, one body is twice the weight of the other, then the barycenter will be one-third of the distance along the line from the larger body. With our planetary system, if we consider just the huge Sun and the Earth, which is minute in comparison to the Sun, then in the heliocentric model, the barycenter is only slightly displaced from the center of the Sun. This raises the question, in the geocentric model, how can the huge Sun circle the tiny Earth? Before we deal with this, we will show that we have a clear example on this Earth of a circular movement that has nothing at the center to hold it. In the heliocentric model, the Earth is rotating once per day in an anticlockwise direction and the Earth's atmosphere rotates with it. Air at the equator travels with the Earth at 0.46 kilometers per second. When an area of low pressure develops in the northern hemisphere, the air at the equator moves north to fill it. As the air moves to a higher latitude, its circumference is smaller, so the air has to start to move around the Earth anticlockwise to maintain its rotational speed of 0.46 kilometers per second. Similarly, the air near the North Pole has little rotational speed, so as it moves to a lower latitude, which has a larger circumference, it must slow down and move to its right to keep the same rotational energy it started with. These two flow patterns combine to produce the well-known cyclone of rotating winds. Now notice carefully what is happening. We have here a huge mass of air that is rotating around a centre, yet there is no central body that is attracting it. This circular movement is entirely due to what are called Coriolis forces that automatically produce these circular motions seemingly from nowhere. There is nothing at the centre that is holding it there. This is an important aspect of these Coriolis forces. Now in the heliocentric model they are called fictitious forces because they only appear to be forces that change the direction of the moving portion of air. In the geocentric model these movements are produced by the rotation of the huge mass of stars around the Earth and they are real forces not fictitious forces. These Coriolis forces, caused by the rotation of the stars, not only produce the circular air movements in the north and south hemispheres, but also produce the oblateness of the Earth's equator and the turning of a pendulum swing at the North Pole. These two are used by heliocentrists to prove that the Earth rotates in space, but they are far better explained by the rotation of the stars around the Earth which causes exactly the same effects. Now let us examine these Coriolis forces in the geocentric model of the whole universe, which includes all the stars, galaxies, the Sun and the planets. This huge mass is circulating around a stationary Earth once per day. The effect that the rotating stars have upon the heavenly bodies is known as Mach's principle, and this is the code word used by secular astronomers to refer obliquely to the geocentric model of the universe. I have dealt with this subject in my YouTube video, Geocentricity, Satellites and Mach. In applying these forces in a geocentric model, it becomes very difficult to picture because we are so used to dealing with local physics inertia, acceleration, kinetic energy, etc. These are all produced by the mass of the stars. 
But when we examine the whole of the universe, including the stars, the whole interaction of these forces becomes very difficult to picture because we are dealing with protophysics. The whole concept of how these forces operate is completely different to the more familiar local physics. Just how different is referred to by Barbour and Bertotti in their very important article Gravity and Inertia in a Marchian Framework. They say the equations describing the motions of the universe as a whole, protophysics, are quite different to the equations describing the local bodies in a given cosmological environment, local physics. The strengths of forces observed locally are determined cosmologically, quoted in the opening summary, emphasis MB. When dealing with gravity, forces or inertia of bodies and particularly Coriolis forces, we cannot see anything and they have to be expressed mathematically. They are not easy to illustrate with diagrams. All that can be done is to show the effects of such forces. It is therefore sufficient to say that cosmologists interested in the Machian principle have examined this subject of protophysics and find that they do produce exactly the complex movements that we see today in the cosmos. Barbour and Bertotti found the Coriolis forces arising out of their examination of the forces in the universe. Gerber, Lenz and Thiering found them arising from their investigations also. They find that the resulting Coriolis forces play an important part in producing the geocentric rotations of all the celestial bodies that are observed today. So accurate is the article by Barbour and Bertotti that they produced results for the precession of the perihelions for all the planets. Einstein deliberately fudged his figures to give the correct precession for Mercury, but when his method was applied to the other planets they gave the wrong results. In fact, the orbits of binary stars with highly unequal masses do not obey Einstein's relativity maths. Physicists know this, but they just shrug their shoulders and ignore this fact. So much for the integrity of relativistic scientists. Although we cannot produce explanatory diagrams or animations in order to show how these forces operate, I refer the viewer to the following. 1. Barbour and Bertotti's article. This is one of the most interesting and important articles that fully supports geocentricity and gives the very advanced maths behind the protophysics workings of the cosmos. It is on my website at www.mbowden.info forward slash barbour.htm Popov's article As a result of this dispute about Barbour and Bertotti's article, I was given a link to a 2013 paper by a secular scientist Popov. This is very similar to their article and has that dreaded word that strikes such fear into the hearts of orthodox scientists actually in its title, The Dynamical Description of the Geocentric Universe. It comes to exactly the same conclusions as the Barbour and Bertotti article and unashamedly refers to Marx's principle as supporting a geocentric universe. I highlight here important extracts from the article. Those wishing to read the whole paper can pause the video. I have also put the paper on my website. The Dynamical Description of the Geocentric Universe Luka Popov, University of Zagreb, Department of Physics Abstract. Using Mach's principle, we will show that the observed diurnal and annual motion of the Earth can just as well be accounted 
as the diurnal rotation and annual revolution of the universe around the fixed and centered Earth. This can be performed by postulating the existence of vector and scalar potentials caused by the simultaneous motion of the masses in the universe, including the distant stars. Quotes. Nevertheless, the physicists and philosophers never cease to debate the various topics under the heading of Marx's principle, which essentially claims the equivalence of all co-moving frames, including non-inertial frames as well. Marx argued that if one could rotate the whole universe around the bucket, the centrifugal forces would be generated, and the concave-shaped surface of the water in the bucket would be identical as in the case of rotating bucket in the fixed universe. Mark extended this principle to the once famous debate between geocentrists and heliocentrists, claiming that both systems can equally be considered correct. Therefore, every notion of absolute motion or a preferred inertial frame, whether inertial or non-inertial, is not a scientific one, but rather a mathematical or philosophical preference, which can easily explain the annual motion of the Sun and the planets in the Neo-Tychonian, i.e. geocentric, system. In the same manner, one can explain the annual motion of the stars and the observation of the stellar parallax. It is the aim of this paper to use the same approach to give the dynamical explanation of the diurnal motion of the celestial bodies as seen from the Earth, and thus give the mathematical justification for the validity of Mach's arguments regarding the equivalence of the Copernican and geocentric systems. The observer can therefore conclude that the celestial bodies perform real circular orbits around the static Earth due to the existence of the vector potential A given by equation 3.1. This conclusion is equivalent to the one that claims that the Earth rotates around the z-axis and the celestial bodies don't. Using this potential alone, one can reproduce the observed retrograde motion of the Mars or explain the effect of the stellar parallax as the real motion of the distant stars in the x-y plane, emphasis mb. One can finally conclude that all celestial bodies in the universe perform the twofold motion around the Earth. 1. Circular motion in the x-y plane due to the vector potential a, 3.1, with a period of approximately 24 hours, and 2 elliptical orbital motion in the xy plane due to the scalar potential UPS 3.5 with a period of approximately one year. It is a matter of trivial exercise to show that these potentials can easily account for the popular proofs of Earth's rotation like the Foucault pendulum or the existence of the geostationary orbits. If one could put the whole universe in accelerated motion around the Earth, the potentials 3.1 and 3.5 would immediately be generated and would keep the universe in that very same state of motion ad infinitum. Thus we have at least two articles by secular astronomers, and there are others, demonstrating that the geocentric model is as viable as the heliocentric model. Indeed, the geocentric model is the only correct interpretation that explains the results of the four experiments of Michelson-Morley, Michelson-Gale, Airy and Sanyak. It is clearly in the providence of God, as we read in Genesis 1 verse 1, that he positioned the specially created earth at the center of a circling super-dense ether before 
he created any of the other heavenly bodies. He would then have no difficulty in embedding these other bodies in this very dense ether on the fourth day when it was already circling the earth once per day as recorded for mankind in Genesis 1 verse 14. What I particularly like is the reference to the creation of the immense number, power and mass of the stars with a delightful and casual off-hand statement Oh, by the way, I nearly forgot. He made the stars also. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for listening.